OK, we're going to look to uh, the mechanism of how various chemicals act at synapses. Now these can either be medical drugs, they can be uh, venoms, they can be toxins, they can be uh, sort of polluting chemicals and they can be of course recreational drugs or drugs of misuse perhaps is a better term. Um, there are a massive variety of these chemicals that can affect synapses so I'm just going to cover the ones that are on the syllabus and um, a few of the common ones that act slightly differently. So there are two sorts of chemicals that can affect synapses. One group is called, they're called antagonists, that means that they have the opposite effect. So if you imagine the correct effect is that the impulse comes down the axon, we get the release of neurotransmitter bonding to the receptors, depolarizing, so the kind of purpose is to depolarize the postsynaptic cell. An antagonist will do the opposite of that, so it would ensure that there's no depolarization here. An agonist enhances the effect of a, a synapse, so the agonist makes more of this depolarization happen. So the ones that are on your syllabus tend to be uh, agonists, so if you'll see on the teacher's guide that you need to know about organophosphates and psychoactive drugs. So we'll deal with organophosphates first of all. So Again, this is why you need to know the sequence of synapses so you can work it out. So organophosphates work on this enzyme here, these um, acetylcholinesterase. Um, and acetylcholine is the one that's found at neuromuscular junctions and makes muscles contract. If we inhibit the acetylcholinesterase, either by competitive or non-competitive inhibition, and you would need to read information in the question about how that's happening if they're going to ask synoptically about enzyme inhibition, then we can't break down the acetylcholine that's in the cleft. So the upshot of that is the acetylcholine gets trapped in this cleft. It's not going anywhere, it's not being broken down and reabsorbed and repackaged and it therefore collides more frequently with all these receptors maintains open sodium ion channels and the membrane sort of continually depolarizes, depolarizes, sort of overstimulating the muscle. Uh, you may also be asked about perhaps um, treatments, so they might say, you know, okay, so we've got an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, but then you've got some other thing that would bind onto that that could be used as a treatment, and you might need to think yourself round quite a complex scenario there. So psychoactive drugs, um, we'll start with cocaine and methamphetamine. Now these obviously, the psychoactive drugs work in the brain by definition, so they alter brain function. And so here we're talking about different transmitters, we're talking about dopamine and we're talking about serotonin. So uh, dopamine is usually released from synaptic vesicles into the clefts in, the, in the, between the neurons of the brain and it has its effect there by linking onto the receptors and depolarizing the next neuron. It's then kind of uptaken directly rather than being broken down by an enzyme. What both uh, cocaine and methamphetamine do is they actually block that uptake out of the cleft, so it blocks the, um, the dopamine being taken back up and leaves the dopamine sitting inside the cleft having its effect. Um, <coughs> marijuana and heroin, uh, they work slightly differently, so normally in the neurons of the brain you get inhibitory transmitters which um, block dopamine release. So it's all a very finely balanced thing, you need dopamine but you need to inhibit it sometimes. So nor the normal sort of situation is that that release of dopamine would be inhibited in certain neurons. What both of those things do is they 
uh, stop the inhibition, so they stop the inhibitory transmitters being released from one neuron, which means from another neuron you would then get dopamine released into the cleft, which then causes depolarization. The more dopamine being in the cleft is the thing that produces that feeling of well-being. Um, ecstasy is another neurotransmitter uh, uptake factor. So uh, ecstasy mimics an, another neurotransmitter in the brain called serotonin and takes up into the synaptic knob better than serotonin does and actually causes the, the synaptic vesicles to release more serotonin into the synaptic cleft where it continues to have an effect. So all of these are working as agonists. Uh, LSD works slightly differently, that's our sort of, you know, that's the psychoactive drug everybody knows about and it is a similar shape to serotonin. So just like in enzymes, anything with a similar shape can then bind onto the receptors and in this case it has exactly the same effect as serotonin. Um, it kind of acts on some neurons and not others, which is the thing that causes all the sort of visual disturbances. <clears throat> so they're the ones that are on your syllabus. Uh, agonists, you need to know about inhibition and what effect that would have, so no uptake of uh, acetylcholine, no breakdown of acetylcholine, stays in the cleft, causes overstimulation. And then I think for psychoactive drugs they will probably give you a bit more information um, because the action involves transmitters that are not on your syllabus. So um, I just thought I'd include some antagonistic things um, that I've come across during my last 30 years of teaching um, that work in the opposite way. So atropine from the deadly nightshade plant or belladonna and curare, which is the uh, one from poison arrow frogs, are both blockers of um, the receptors for acetylcholine. And I think that also the venom of the crate, uh, the small brown snake in India, very, very venomous, works in the same way. So these, again, they're similar, like LSD is to serotonin, these are similar shapes to acetylcholine, but this time instead of mimicking the effect, they just block the receptors. So if there's something sitting in these receptors, the acetylcholine can't get in, So in, just in the manner of competitive inhibition. Now if the acetylcholine can't get in, then the sodium ion channels can't open, and therefore there's no depolarization of the postsynaptic cells and certainly in muscles that causes a complete muscle relaxation. Useful if you're hunting, you know, if you're in the Amazon jungle with a blowpipe and some poison arrow darts because the monkey completely relaxes and falls out the tree at your feet to be eaten. Um, not, not quite as good I suppose if you get bitten by a snake. Um, Botox is another one that you might come across um, in your life. I don't know why you would want to inject a bacterial toxin into your face, but anyway, some people do. Uh, so Botox um, blocks the release. So it, it actually, it, these exocytosis, and it's again a bit more detail, but you might be given detail of that process. Exocytosis relies on proteins called snare proteins in the membrane of the vesicle which link on to uh, other proteins in the membrane and therefore allow exocytosis. What um, botulin, what a botulinum toxin or Botox does is it shears those uh, snare proteins so that those, the vesicles will not link on to that membrane. So even if you've got calcium ions, they move to the membrane, but they can't link on to it and therefore there's no exocytosis. No exocytosis, no acetylcholine, and again it's going to relax the muscles, which is great if you want to get rid of your wrinkles. Um, some medical drugs act as calcium ion blockers at certain synapses, and you can see from what you know about synapses, 
if you block the entrance of the calcium ions, then the vesicles won't move to the membrane. Again, no exocytosis, no neurotransmitter linking to the receptors, and you've got a bit of muscle relaxation going on there. The odd one out really is a, one that you might come across called GABA. Now GABA acts in an antagonistic way, but not by blocking or uh, a, a receptor or by preventing exocytosis in some way. It actually acts on the postsynaptic membrane, so that makes it quite unusual. And what it does on the postsynaptic membrane is it opens calcium ion channels. So now we've got uh, sorry, calcium, chloride ion channels. So now we've got chloride ions in the postsynaptic cell. Chloride ions, as we all know, are negatively charged. So if you imagine the resting potential of that cell is there and you put more negative ions in, it will go down. Now if that's our threshold value up here, you can see that usually you have to have that much sodium ions moving into each threshold. If you put more negative charge in, you need more sodium ions to go in to meet the threshold to cause the action potential. So they tend to be inhibitory just because you need to have more depolarization in order to reach threshold. Okay, I hope that helps. Remember it's the principles that are important. Um, if you're really interested in neurotoxins, there you can look it up. Wikipedia's got a huge list of neurotoxins with some details of how they act. Um, if you just type in neurotoxins into Google, you'll get huge numbers of neurotoxins. They all act slightly differently. Um, but the overall principles you're looking for are is it stimulating? Is it going to stimulate? Is it going to stop? Is it an antagonist? Is it an agonist? How is it working? What process is it interfering with? Okay, good luck.